All right. Well, this is InfoSec Decoded with Global Thermonuclear War. And Alan has that story uh, starting out with uh, potential Russian cyber attacks. Yes, indeed. The, the drums of war are beating loudly on the border of uh, Russia and Ukraine, and it's going to have global consequences. As a matter of fact, the Department of Homeland Security is now warning of uh, cyber attacks originating in Russia, cyber attacks against the US, to say nothing of the rest of the world. And they told uh, all the Americans to leave the country. Oh, have they really? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Like three days ago. <laughs> uh, leave Russia or leave Ukraine? Leave Ukraine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is not a good sign. No, it is not. The Ukrainians are alarming. protesting and say, hey, hey, wait, you're all leaving and we're going to stay here and die? Wait. This is not what we thought how it was going to go. Yeah, well, it'd be even more alarming if Americans were being told to leave Russia. That has not happened yet. No, okay. All right. So, yes, it, at a minimum, the U.S. can expect to see, uh, or possibly can see, cyber attacks originating from Russia. And I, I just don't know what else uh, Russia, or rather American companies and critical infrastructure can do really uh, you can't really improve your cybersecurity posture in a week or two not not uh, at least not sufficiently to fight off uh, state-sponsored well, hackers like well those in actually Russia. actually you can i'm actually involved in a bunch of training courses for big corporations for exactly this purpose if you have a proper threat response team you do respond to that intel you have an instant response team and a threat hunting team, and they, in fact, take these warnings, and then they set up things to scan their network for those rules, techniques, and procedures. So the largest companies can actually benefit from this kind of warning. But I think medium and small business are not ready yet. No, certainly not the small ones, but even the large ones, that requires a certain investment and skill level that... Anybody that's been I, fighting APTs I'm seriously... I'm yeah, anybody who's been fighting APT seriously has that skill level. They really right, right. are our team. And that's who this is really aimed at. Yeah, but if the volume of attacks goes up also, I don't know if they'll have the, the capacity to address all the possible attacks. Well, we'll see. Obviously, uh, some get through like the Colonial Pipeline. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's not looking good. And if there should be a series of Russian attacks on American infrastructure like Colonial Pipeline. Um, I would be very interested to see what the American political response will be. Uh, it's not far-fetched to imagine that certain figures in American politics would refuse to believe or would refuse to acknowledge that Russian hackers are behind this and that they would instead accuse, say, Ukrainian hackers for executing this. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, they did that last time. I hadn't thought of that, but that would be the next thing. Yeah. Because, I mean, the Fox News and the Republican Party seem to just be mouthpieces of Russian propaganda. Those just repeat anything that they see. I mean, it's it's <clears throat> almost impossible to believe, but the there are certain figures, especially figures within the Republican establishment now, who are supporters of Russia. and. Oh, yeah. They, as you said, are mouthpieces for Russian pro propaganda. Well, Fox News has, you know, they're saying it, the Russians are perfectly fine. They're just defending their borders. The same we should do here. We should, like, help them invade Ukraine and cheer them on. Yeah, yeah. And so I can imagine a time in which uh, there will be Republicans attacking the Biden administration and defending the Republican, or excuse me, defending the Russian. Yeah, like aggression. Trump. That was Trump's position. Yes, Yes, and so that, I mean, that will be really disturbing. That will be truly, truly the most disturbing development in American politics in, in years. Well, you know, there's um, the Republican, uh, um, whose name I've forgotten, uh, who just came out and said that the entire January 6th commission will be thrown in prison for their crimes for daring to investigate the Republicans. I think that was Newt Gingrich. Newt Gingrich. And, and, you know, this, this does reflect what Trump also wanted, which is what Putin had, because where there are no laws, it's just the boss that goes off with your head. You have dared to displease me. And yet I do think there are Republicans who genuinely, sincerely believe this Republican propaganda, or excuse me, this, this Russian propaganda. Well, you know, I'm, what I've heard, 
uh, what I've read, you know, about people that actually interview Washington lawmakers is that almost none of them believe anything they've been saying for the last four years. They're all just putting on an act like a theater to fool their supporters into voting for them. But the state legislators actually do believe it. So well, they it kind of have been the dumber ones. Well, it kind of reminds me of the Catholic Church in the time of Martin Luther, when the Pope was incredibly cynical, having pagan orgies and not obeying the faith at all. And the loyal worshipers in Germany believed sincerely that this was all true. Corruption at the top, but gullible people at the bottom. Anyway, uh, all right, then I've got this one I thought was wonderful. This is a video from Joe Grand. And um, I've had somebody wanted me to do a security audit of a hardware wallet for cryptocurrency. And I said, I'm not really a hardware hacker. I'm not competent to do this. But Joe is. And it was very interesting because I've been kind of unclear about what the point of a hardware wallet is. But what it is, is a special device, basically like a phone with a basically a TPM chip so that the secrets are concealed and can't be easily accessed, even when you plug it in over USB. And somebody forgot the pin for their hardware wallet and the crypto in there was now worth two million dollars and they went online and begged for help and joe helped him and he explains what he did this particular brand of hardware wallet actually publishes vulnerabilities of the old versions of their software and he found a vulnerability but that's why i know i'm not a real hardware hacker because to do this he had to have like five custom devices that would connect it solder to the pins remove the capacitors then put in a voltage supply that will deliberately deviate from the correct value to cause the chips to make errors and then reboot it and then try to um, trick it into giving you access to the memory you're not supposed to have access to. And he rigged this all up practicing with a, a normal one and got the guy to fly in from wherever he was with the real device and plugged it in. And then you let it run for like six hours, every, rebooting every one second trying to call it for the voltage fluctuation to trick it into having an error and it worked and you find the missing pin so it's pretty awesome but you have to have all that equipment and all that expertise to to uh do these interesting attacks i thought it was a very great attack um lowering the voltage or putting in electrical signals to glitch the processor is a very powerful technique fault injection but you need special equipment and special skills to do it yeah, Thunderbolt. In fact, Sam, one second. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I when this came up, I, I turned to Caitlin. I said, I believe Caitlin can probably do a proper job of this hardware hacking. I certainly can't. <clears throat> so what do you got there? I think you're on mute or something. I am on mute. So yeah. this is called the Chip Whisperer. And this is what's exactly what it's designed to do, which is, um, you know, sort of glitch, intentionally glitch uh, systems in order to, to do that sort of attack. That's what he used. He called it the whisperer. So it, it, it is pre-programmed to send the correct amount of wrong voltage. Yep, pretty much. That's great. Yeah, he had like four different devices like that with names that he connected together to accomplish this task. Yeah, and yeah, and I remember we were talking about it and and you, you mentioned that the guy that, Sorry, so that, that someone wanted to send just one over and one me to test it. And that's not really the way to do it. You really do need to have like a stock of, of, of devices because you're going to destroy a few. Sure. And um, that's just part of the process. Well, sure, sure. Yep. All right. All right. And so Liz has got pirates. Yes. Yeah, so I, I, I found this story charming for a multitude of reasons. Um, not least of which uh, I've always been sort of fascinated by uh, number stations on uh, shortwave bands, but uh, this is a really cool story about how uh, some pirates um, hacked a um, what was has been suspected to be a um, um, Soviet uh, number station um and uh how they did the things they did were were really kind of cool because uh, some very sort of uh interesting trolling so um pretty sure uh it's um 
uh, coming from the, the Ukraine, somebody in the Ukraine, but uh, they obviously you can't really tell, uh, but it's pretty interesting because um, these folks have been, essentially they took over the shortwave station and uh, were broadcasting, um, well, I, I didn't even know, you, didn't even really think about this as being a thing you could do, but of course you can, they, uh, uh, sent um, stuff, you know, uh, amusing things like annoying music. Uh, Gagnum style was one of their uh, one of their selections. But one of the coolest things they did was these. Um, they sent um, this audio that, if you looked at it with a uh, spectrum analyzer, it um, shows images. And essentially, they were just sending various memes. Um, over the shortwave station, uh, but it was a pretty good way to um, pretty good way to, to to mess with the opposition. And this is sort of like the uh, um, Max Headroom attack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It totally is like the Max Headroom attack. So, you know, good old fashioned fun. Yep. All right. And Caitlin has got the consequence of crypto having a price drop. Yes, thankfully, uh, crypto is having a slight price drop, and like GPU prices are actually, finally yeah, what? Like fifty percent, which is in yeah. fact not that unusual for crypto. It's very yeah, but uh, it's affecting GPU prices finally. So GPU prices are starting to drop, which is absolutely fantastic. So Tom's Hardware has an article written by Aaron Klotz uh, talking about this situation, and so it, it, they're only going down by a little bit. So for example, in December. So last month, uh, an RTX 3090 on eBay was going for about $2,803. Uh, a month later, it's only going for $2,550. So this is still outrageous, but it's not outrageous as it was. Um, and so I got curious and I, I thought, well, these are all about like the 3080s and stuff. How much is, is my video card going, going for? Uh, so I got a, five, a cheap, quote unquote cheap. Uh, $500 video card uh, just before the whole uh, supply chain started. Uh, started. Um, and by cheap, I mean, it was like, it was exactly $500. I mean, they were really price pointing that thing for 500. And um, I went on to eBay today and the cheapest you can get it now is about $1,000. So everything is still ridiculously overpriced, even for older graphics cards and um, and especially newer ones. But we are starting to see a drop, which is good. So hopefully, we'll that this trend will continue and people will be able to buy and build computers again. Well, I highly doubt that. I Me the too. Price of, <laughs> the price of crypto is going to go back up. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the price of crypto will go back up, but yeah, something needs to be done because. You know, crypto is, is fun and everything, but people still need to build computers. And this is ridiculous that the crypto people are, are hogging all the hardware. Well, what's going to be done is next year, Ethereum is going to switch to proof of stake. And then these GPUs won't be useful anymore. And uh, the pressure is building on Bitcoin to do the same thing. So that, I think, will be the solution over the next few years. Yeah, something has to be done. I mean, and this is just one of the big problems. Of course, we have to deal with pollution, energy usage. Um, which will get fixed by switching to proof of stake. Yeah, yeah. So proof of stake will be a big improvement for sure. Yeah, so, yeah. Yep. Then we can have our NFTs and we don't have to hear quite so much whining about them. I, well, <laughs> I don't know about that. You know, I, you know for, some peop, for some reason, people seem to be very upset about obvious pyramid schemes. I don't know why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you just have to get used to it. Anyway. Um, all right. So uh, Canada got hacked. Irvin's got this one. Yes, no more maple syrup. I'm sorry. Oh, I heard about that. In fact, there was a maple syrup shortage in Canada about a month ago. Yeah. Uh, but this is not related to that. Yeah. This is just uh, from Ottawa that uh, their foreign ministry was hit. Uh, and taking point that Canada is also taking a strong point against uh, Russia's military buildup. So they're kind of thinking maybe that's what it is. That would be likely. It, you know, they don't have any details, right? Sounds like maybe a right. DDoS, maybe ransomware. Right. No, no uh, details. Okay. 
my guess is the supply of maple syrup has been hit. Well, I think that would be headline news. Right. All right. And uh, so Alan has got Belarus, the rail system. It's one of the more interesting hacktivist attacks of recent years. Uh, a group calling itself Belarusian Cyber Partisans has attacked the National Railway of Belarus. And by the way, these Belarusian Cyber Partisans are Belarusian themselves. So they are, um, they are not, for, this is not a foreign entity. And this group has been active in the past. This is not the first time that they have uh, engaged in, hyper, uh, in hacktivism. But what they've done is they seem to have gotten into the networks of the National Railway and they, have, uh, they haven't destroyed everything, but they have encrypted a number of servers used in the administration of the ticketing systems um, and also uh, just general administration, but not any of the systems would affect the safety of the lines. And why are they doing this? It's because the uh, uh, Russian military is using Belarusian lines, railroad lines um, for some military exercises and also possibly uh, in advance of the uh, Ukraine invasion. And these Belarusians are not very happy about that as it turns out. So there, there is of course a very long standing relationship between the president of Belarus, uh, Lukashenko, and Russia. So Belarus has become something of a client state and receives quite a lot of aid and support from Russia. So, You've got your helicopter noise again. Oh, it's fading out. Okay, go ahead. All right. Uh, so there's there is quite a lot of political backstory to this. But yeah. the cyber partisans, they're demanding that the Russians vacate the, uh, the rail lines and leave the country. Mm -hmm. And they also demand the release of 50 political prisoners that have been imprisoned by the Lukashenko re regime. Yeah. Weren't, weren't they uh, able to prevent some armaments from being um, imported to? From Recently the or in the past? Uh, no, through this attack. Oh, I don't know if they've actually had any practical effect. Um. I thought that I had read that because I thought this was a really cool story too. Um, great use of ransomware. Yeah, I mean, it reminds me of a protest I was involved in decades ago in the first or sec I think the first Iraq war. There were a bunch of activists that went and tore up the track at the Concord Naval Weapons Station doing exactly the same thing, saying, wow. we don't want you sending this military gear over into this rotten war. I was just a journalist covering it and I was sort of horrified at these, you know, sort of hippies uh, making trouble right in front of a fence full of serious military weapons there, but they didn't shoot people, but they certainly could have. <laughs> this was during the first Gulf War? Yeah, yeah, a lot of protest against that here. Mm -hmm. And they tried to do just the same thing. They tried to uh, stop the military hardware from moving around. <clears throat> All right, and... Uh, so this one I was very interested to hear about. So the Creative Commons license, I use it myself. A lot of people do. Um, if you want to donate something to the world, you go to this Creative Commons website and they will write a legal document which says, here, everybody can use my stuff. But it turns out that an old version of the Creative Commons license had a bug in it. What it said is everybody can use my stuff, but you should give me credit and link back to the original source. And I never noticed that. And a lot of people don't notice that. So they take that stuff and images and everything and put it in their stuff. And technically they're not obeying the license. Now, normally nobody cares because you put creative comments on it because you want to share. But now there's a new form of patent troll um, where there are companies that scour the internet to find cases where something with creative comments is used without the proper attribution. And then they contact the owner and say, okay, I'm going to sue these guys and get money and we'll split the money half for you and half for me. So they are like uh, bounty hunters. And um, they went after Cory Doctorow. And that was a mistake, of course, because Cory Doctorow <laughs> wrote Creative Commons and has been using it for years and is an expert in how it works. But that's what they do. And what they're doing, this is like just like patent trolls. What they're doing is apparently technically legal, but very irritating and 
and frustrating and sort of dishonest. And now the point is what they do is they say, the law says we could actually sue you for $150,000 for violating the creative common license, but we'll settle for just like 2000. And this is very much like all the RIA lawsuits where people, the recording industry would sue their own customers and you'd pay a fine. So another form of a uh, trouble out there. I thought there was some kind of, supposed, supposedly, I thought there was some, some kind of judicial protection intended to uh, uh, protect against frivolous um, lawsuits or, or, you know, people yeah. being overly litigious like that's, this. That's slap suits, but I don't think it would apply here because technically they're right. Technically, you did use the image, not obey the terms of service. You're technically infringing. I don't think any court would say they're wrong to do this legally. Well, it's and, and you know, usually with these types of scams, the, the, the goal is to get people to settle. Well, yeah, but I mean, that's, this is the problem. I mean, I think they're on firm legal ground, as a matter of fact. <laughs> It just violates the whole principle of the thing. And that's what Corey says. He says, look, the only reason anybody would put creative comments on their stuff is they want people to use it. So they improve the creative commons license for what it says is if you don't credit me, then um, when I complain, you have 30 days to fix it, which is much more what we really meant all along. We didn't really want people to get sued. We wanted people to use our stuff. <laughs> anyway. Um, all right. And so Caitlin has got the FCC. The FCC is back in the news, this time doing a very good thing. Ars Technica has an article written by uh, John uh, Brodkin uh, talking about how landlords are putting up new buildings and then partnering up with internet service providers so that the two go into an agreement locking the, the people in the building into a single ISP. So for example, uh, you you rent an apartment at a new place, and it turns out that that because the owner of the building uh, makes money from Comcast, you can only get internet from Comcast. And the FCC is blowing the whistle on this and saying this is not uh, not okay. This is against FCC rules, which allows consumers to choose which ISP they they use. Now in America, this is kind of an a thorny issue because we've sort of divided the U.S. into these like ISP thiefdoms, <laughs> where there's really only like one option in a lot of places. So even even without this, you know, without these shenanigans, a lot of consumers are still stuck with one ISP, which the FCC really should to do something about. Um, but this is definitely a step in the right direction and something I definitely don't, don't want seeing. People should be able to choose their ISP and not be locked in with someone who they don't like, they don't like dealing with, et cetera, so. Yeah, yeah, this is, I think, the in the spirit of the antitrust stuff that Elizabeth Warren wants to do where you just have to uh, aerate the ecosystem to encourage competition. So yep. one monopoly player doesn't just crush everybody. Absolutely. I mean, we're lucky enough to live in the Bay Area where we have Choices, and I definitely exercise those choices myself. Um, I, I've I've had deals or is I, I've used Comcast and AT and T before, and we have both those available in our area, and both of them are just absolutely terrible. I just in terms of customer service. I mean, they're and and uptime too. My gosh, like half the people I know, whenever there's an internet outage, it's usually Comcast. <laughs> you know, like, it just, some of us have choices in the Bay Area, depending on where where we are. Well, I true, mean, true. I, I, those are my only options, and well, they are terrible like, options. Well, people like you are not really in the Bay Area. Where you are is technically Montana. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I'm I, I happen to be 30 minutes from downtown San Francisco, but it yeah, looks kind of like Montana. Yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't count. There's no Elon. Real I'm still waiting on Starlink. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, Starlink is, is going to be a very good, good solution. Um, I think smaller ISPs are really where we need to go to. Uh, yeah. Community-based ISPs. Sonic. I wish we had Sonic. I yeah. Yeah. And that, that's, for example, what I use. I, Everybody loves Sonic, if you can get it. If you can get it. Yeah. Uh, it's in our area. So this is only in our area. Yeah. Uh, Sonic is a, um, they, they were from a community college. They started off at a community college. 
and sort of branched off from there. And they basically piggyback off AT&T's lines, um, but they'll deal with AT&T and then you can just, you know, if you have an issue, you can call them and they'll, you know, fix things up and their service is fantastic. And yeah, definitely smaller ISPs are the way to go. Um, the other, nice. the other solution is, um, and I've seen this done before, and if I don't know how to do this, but anyone can become an ISP. Yeah. Um, you can, and then share it with your neighbors or ask your neighbors to like buy in. So yeah. for example, if you wanted to do something for just your neighborhood, uh, you could get a line, like a fiber optic line built right into like your garage. Uh, and then, you know, hook, hook your neighbors up uh, to, to your you know, quote unquote ISP, you know, for like a monthly fee, that that's also an option too. So. Sounds expensive. It, it, well, that's why, that's why you share it with the neighborhood. You don't just do it for yourself because for one person, it's too expensive, um, but it is possible for individuals to become ISPs. Um, and, and, and mesh networks are cool. There's a, a really cool, um, you know, uh, uh, hacker space um, that, that's been leading a, um, mesh network uh in the east bay here but you know for me line of sight's a problem and for a lot of folks so uh yeah. you know it's not a perfect solution yeah i know in ham radio community uh there's a lot of work on something called um uh, wem uh, which is a wireless mesh network uh using yeah just line of sights and it's supposed to be like an emergency network i think um, but, but there's, yeah, definitely a lot of, of hobbyists working on sort of ad hoc mesh networking for communications. So. When I taught a hacking class, I had an Italian student who was really surprised. He said in Italy, there's a dark mesh network, not connected to the internet. People put it in their windows and everybody's on it because that's where you find all the movies and music and zines about hacking and everything. And he was really surprised we don't have that in America. Boy, in Italy, that's what everybody needs. That's where all the good stuff is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we could, you know, that, and another solution, of course, is why does it have to be the internet? <laughs> um, we can set up special networks specifically for like low bandwidth, you know, communication between each other where you don't necessarily need line of sight. Like the old BBSs. Like, yeah, old BBSs. Um, yeah, I bet they're still out there but I think they're just falling into disfavor. Anyway, so Liz has got malicious QR codes. Yeah, the, uh, this was kind of a, a interesting story um, that uh, came out uh, recently. I thought it was, it was kind of cool. Um, it was in uh, an article that was in uh, Bleeping Computer, uh, but it was about an FBI, uh, press release uh, warning warning folks about being careful about QR codes. And we knew they were problematic, but uh, there's been an uptick in fraudulent use of those recently. And a um, couple, couple interesting ways that uh, uh, threat actors are using them. One of them is uh, that they're handy in um, phishing emails because a lot of the time the, um, uh, software used to catch uh, those malicious emails will, will not flag the QR code. Um, so they get by with using that instead of like a, a button with a hyperlink, which is pretty interesting. Um, and another one that is pretty interesting that's been used lately is that uh, they will um, essentially hijack or tamper with legitimate QR codes. Like for example, um, this is so stupid, but they, they have them on ATM machines sometimes. And so somebody will just come and uh, slap a, a sticker with a different QR code over the bank's uh, QR code sticker and uh, route folks to their um, nasty, uh, <laughs> their, their nasty site. So um, be careful. You know that they are handy sometimes, but don't just indiscriminately visit links that are uh, that you're sent to through QR codes. I wonder if you could do anything about this, like have a signature in a QR code to verify that it's legit somehow. That'd be interesting. I think another one that would be good would be uh, you know just exposing the. Um, redirects that happen you know where you know if it, it popped up a list of 
uh, where where you're going when you uh, when you use the QR when you activate the QR code. I think that could be helpful as well. Well, the problem is, of course, with everybody on cell phones, you can't even see the URL. You yeah. Of real estate, and I'm sure that 99% of users would not know what to make of the URLs they see going by. Right. Yeah, it's it's a tough one. Like HTTPS turns out not to be as great as we all hoped. Yeah. All right. And so then Urban has got the RAA. Yes, uh, they are continuing the fight over uh, being able to download off of YouTube. Uh, the argument continues that we shouldn't be able to use tools like YouTube DL to get such videos. And in their, uh, in their arguments, they talked about how the EFF likes to side with infringers and to throw out uh, their letter because it because they always are siding with the bad guy. Well, that's true of all privacy people. They, the law enforcement people are on the other side. Yeah, this is the continuation of the fight that's been going on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it seems again like the law is to some extent on the side of the people, the RIA. They do supposedly have some right to stop people from making unauthorized copies of content. And the whole internet makes that technically very difficult to achieve. Just a bit. Yep. Yeah. All right. And uh, so that gets us back up to Alan with the Death Star. With the Death Star option. Uh, this is my last Russia Ukraine story for the day, I promise. Um, apparently, according to Dan Gooden of Ars Technica, the US government is considering a special set of sanctions against the Russian government should it choose to invade Ukraine. It's not Dan Gooden. Oh, excuse me. You're right. I'm so conditioned to expecting yeah. stories from Dan it Gooden. Usually no, this is, time it's from this... Tim Deshant. Yeah, Dan doesn't seem to do the politics ones. Anyway, go ahead. That's a good point. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, and what this uh, a potential set of sanctions entails is cutting off Russia's supply from semiconductors, even though most semiconductors, of course, are manufactured in Asia, whether it's Taiwan, China, Japan, yeah. South Korea. So how Korea. could you do that? <laughs> well, <laughs> the, the US still is highly influential just because many of the patents are held in the US and because many of the companies licensing the technology, such as ARM, have active development in the US. And so since when does anybody in China care about our patent rights? <laughs> well, no, Here, but here's the thing. The US can cut off the supply. And this is why Huawei. The supply of what? What the do we control? Of, the supply of silicon, not the material, but of the, the processors. Why? They make them in Taiwan. How can we stop that? <laughs> Well, I don't know the mechanisms, but it's very effective. After all, if Huawei has been forced to abandon the cell phone market because they can no longer get uh, ARM technology or Qualcomm technology. Really? Oh, yeah. They're out. And that I'd used like to be to the know. third oh. largest handset manufacturer uh, and brand in the world. How do we have power over that? Well, uh, that's, uh, that's American power for you there. So Huawei is out of the, the handset market. It's also uh, mostly out of the 5G market, at least in, in large part. Um, and so that means that uh, if the U.S. wants to put the squeeze on Russia by blocking the uh, sale of, of uh, silicon, then it's entirely doable. And this would be a big problem for Russia because Russia still in the early days of building out its 5G mobile network. And without access to the major European 5G manufacturers such as Ericsson and Nokia, that would leave Russia with really only Huawei. And Huawei can't do that. Huawei, again, doesn't have access to that technology. Hmm. And so they wouldn't be able to deliver on true 5G infrastructure. So this is considered a really provocative act um, but the U.S. may well do it because uh, the U.S. has already imposed economic sanctions on Russia going back to, I believe, 2014. And um, these sanctions were very effective because Russia is highly dependent on Russia, uh, oil exports. Yeah. Um, 
But apparently Putin, the Putin regime has figured out ways to get around the sanctions and has figured out um, how to soften the blow of any potential uh, future sanctions. And so those economic sanctions would be less effective this time around. So to use the threat of cutting off semiconductors, that would be much more effective probably. Maybe not immediately, it wouldn't have the same instant impact that oil related sanctions would have, but it would still have an impact on the uh, technological capacity of Russia going forward. So is there any chance of the government actually doing this? Sounds like it's under serious consideration, according right. to Tim Jashant. Okay. Well, that's interesting. And uh, this one I thought was pretty shocking. There's a Twitter thread from a person who analyzed the public website and showed that the Chicago public schools are doing what Florida did about a year ago. The um, people sending their kids to school are upset about the COVID outbreaks, so they simply adjusted the numbers so that the COVID cases look smaller. They have a list of uh, a feed of, of the number of COVID cases in the state, and until a week or two ago, each one was marked by what school district it was in, so you could go to a website and see how many cases there were in your school, and what they did was remove the marker for schools. So the total stays the same, but suddenly the number of cases in your schools falls to zero. If you add up all the cases in all the schools, it no longer adds up to the total because they don't mark them. And this is, they did this, uh, uh, Como did this in New York City to cover up the COVID cases and DeSantis did it many times in Florida to cover up the COVID cases. Um, there are no apparently federal requirements to report your state COVID cases. And so a lot of states figured out that they would just stop reporting them and try to pretend it's not happening. And that's what's happening in Chicago now. So with every chapter and verses in this thread, it's interesting to see. Um, not exactly surprising, but pretty much a good idea. I see a lot of people angry about this going back to school. They say everybody's getting sick. The students don't wanna be there. The teachers don't wanna be there. The teachers are out sick all the time. People aren't really learning anything. They make it sound like a disaster, this going back to face to face. I don't know how bad it really is, but there's a lot of people with horror stories. I think it'd be pretty bad if we went back to this, considering how contagious this uh, uh, variant is. I'm really glad that I am not uh, having to ex expose my students. Yeah, well, I guess you're right. And by the way, uh, there's now Omicron CE or something, twice as bad as Omicron spreading in other countries. So we're totally not out of the woods yet. <laughs> anyway, um, all right. And so Caitlin, oh, is, yeah. I was going to say Omicron XP. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> Omicron with two letters, AB or something. But apparently it's <laughs> even more spready than Omicron, Omicron Deluxe. Yeah, yeah that's right. that's yes, going to be yeah. like Omicron Plus. Yeah, that's it. That's what well, it is. BA2 is the official designation. BA2, OK. In, in Denmark, it's out competing the original Omicron BA1 by right. 90%. And right, in which, the UK, it's out competing by 120%. Wow. Yeah, so, so so we got something to look forward to. Yeah, so it's incredibly, incredibly uh, infectious. I mean, and Omicron was already a champ, but now the BA2, which some are advocating be uh, labeled with a new Greek letter as a VOC variant of concern, yeah, it's even far more effective, potentially. I, so I happen to... We should live, just stay inside forever and never leave again. I happened to live near an elementary school and I was out with the dogs last night and I just happened to overhear the, these uh, families outside uh, waiting for their kids talking about how everybody had gotten it and had just gone through this elementary school like wildfire. <laughs> yeah. Which is what you'd expect. Yeah, all right. And Liz has got the IRS. Yeah, so uh, I, I put a, there are actually several uh, articles about um, the newest uh, terrible misuse of uh, biometrics, which is now the um, <laughs> IRS has joined uh, up with a company called uh, IDME, which is incredibly difficult to use. Uh, I felt a little better when I read one of these articles uh, because uh, Brian Krebs um, 
was in it and talked about how he uh, tried to undergo this verification process with them uh, and it took forever and, and essentially ground, ground to a halt uh, with no, no ability to resolve it. That was the same experience I had when I tried to use it uh, for something else. Um, having to do with the state of California and uh, what a disaster this is. So now we've decided that uh, we're going to be implementing this for um, ac accessing uh, our uh, online tax returns. And essentially the, the IRS is gonna gonna uh, expect you to um, upload a video selfie, um, which just seems like a really terrible idea, you know. The, we we and, and especially considering it's this this third party company. I really am not a fan of the, these trends where you're you're forced to um, hand over your biometric info to um, sketchy third party companies that have contracted with the government. But here we are. Well, you know, biometrics could be pretty nice, but not if they don't work. Well, I'm not really convinced that this is going to be effective or that it's necessary. It really seems like, a, especially with taxes, really seems like a solution in search of a problem. Yeah, yeah. Well, it doesn't have the blockchain in it. Yeah, right. What about the, well, but it probably does have AI, so. Probably, that would be great, because you know how great AI is at telling one face for another right i remember the one they tried like 10 years ago where they put like supreme court justices and then identified like half of them as wanted murderers um and and apparently they uh also um this company also co uh collects uh uh voice um voice biometrics so like like when we were in china like with baidu when they could get your voice signature within 20 seconds or whatever so um so that's great uh and now now when you uh, so now when you lock on to the uh the internet you're gonna have to provide not just your id uh but also a utility bill and a uh a, a video selfie so things we have to look forward to because Doing our taxes was not already difficult and onerous enough in this country. Let's add some more layers of complexity. I mean, why not? We need more layers of complexity. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, good thing we're pumping a ton more money into the IRS. Thank you, Joe Biden. Oh, well, there you go. All right. Mm -hmm, the IRS. And Caitlin has women in STEM. Yes. Uh, let's talk about women in STEM. Uh, so Allison Light has an article written here on, let's see, The Conversation, uh, talking about what happens when women join STEM fields, like they become a majority participant in a certain STEM field. It turns out that women, if you have a, if you have a STEM field with a lot of women, uh, like sociology, uh, people tend to perceive it as a soft science rather than a hard science. Um, and this not just uh, applies to sociology, but also to things like um, uh, certain biological sciences too. Like any sort of science where we see a large influx of women, the perception of it starts to, um, uh, st starts to be that of that it's a soft science, um, which is very telling of our underlying biases in society. Um, and it also shows that, you know, simply asking women to go into STEM or encouraging women to go into STEM is not really a, a, a full solution to the problem of sexism in the workplace, right? Or, or it's, it's, not the, it's not the big, it's not the biggest issue, you know, women in STEM or getting women in STEM is not the biggest issue of sexism that really needs to be addressed. Uh, and so uh, another uh, interesting, uh, finding of this research. And by the way, this is all published. It's the article, the, the actual article, the journal article is on Science Direct. It's called Gender Representation Cues, Labels of Hard and Soft Sciences. Um, one of the more interesting, um, uh, one of the more interesting findings is that, let's see if I can find it. I had it highlighted here. Um, uh, okay, here we go. So 
Uh, let me just read out this uh, paragraph here, word for word, quote unquote. Uh, when women make up more than 25% of graduate students in a discipline, um, men to lesser, and to a lesser extent women become less interested in pursuing that discipline, salaries go down. Um, and other studies have found that the same job is seen as a deserving a lower salary. And this has been something that employers have used for a long time uh, when there is a field and they just really wanna pay people as little as possible. They try to get women into that field as you know as soon as possible, and that's why a lot of these, you know, initiatives to get women into STEM uh, can sometimes be a little sus. Uh, and for example, in the United States, uh, you maybe have noticed that a lot of your elementary school teachers are women. This is not because people thought women are better at teaching or that women are are better with children. It's because we can pay women less. And this is where the profession of, of having mostly women as teachers came from. Um, and so where you need a lot of people and you wanna pay them as little as possible, you try to incentivize women to get into that field. And that's exactly what's happening today in, um, in STEM. However, I will say that this study is not all doom and gloom. Um, it turns out that when you have women uh, in your STEM program and people are forced to work alongside um, uh, people of all genders, uh, they become uh, less sexist in their, in their personal attitudes. So they no longer feel that like women, uh, you know, can't do this or, you know, can't, can't exceed in, uh, in doing well in STEM fields. Um, so that's, that's a positive of this, but yeah, um, there, there are definitely some underlying assumptions and prejudices in society that we really need to start addressing if we want to really achieve some sort of parity um, in STEM fields. So I think what would help is if women not only entered STEM, but once they got in, they hacked everything to gain respect. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's my plan. Um, <laughs> th this works. Yeah. Uh, and it's certainly, you know, it's not, it's not enough that, that, um, uh, that, that women go into STEM fields uh, when women get into STEM fields, uh, we have to make sure that the men fear us and, and submit to us. There you go. And this was, I remember in, in, old, in Berkeley, they had the SCUM group, Society for Cutting Up Men. Yes, there you go. Yeah. All right. So Irvin has got people suing Google. Boy, good luck with that. Who suing right. Google? <laughs> Four state attorney generals. Four attorney generals are suing Google uh, for misleading uh, users on tracking their location. They're looking at 2014 to 2019 that uh, they that Google said that by turning off location history, it would stop tracking, but uh, all those four AGs say that it still did it. And I'm like, really? Unless you're going to tell me water's wet. That reminds me of uh, browser private mode. And, you know, uh -huh. uh, I'm always suspected that probably doesn't do very much. Yeah. Yeah, and Google yeah. has so many ways to track it. Yep, yep, yep. So yeah, they're saying uh, Google could find other ways, and we want to sue them for that. Well, I mean, another one is Google claimed they anonymized their data years ago, but they kept the last octet of your IP address and mm -hmm. some other information, so they still know who you are. They, yeah, they still do. Yeah. So we'll see what happens out of this. Yeah, yeah, well, they might get a settlement. All right, well, that's it for this one. And we will be back on Friday.